When you ask the average gamer what they would think of an L.A. Noir sequel, their overwhelming reaction tends to be... Yes. At least as was demonstrated in my extremely scientific poll the other day. Most people who have played the original game hold remarkably warm feelings towards the IP in general. It was, after all, one of the most groundbreaking games of its time, regardless of how it's aged up to this point. Simply, L.A. Noir has cultivated a fan base that demands a sequel, spiritually or not. A sequel that we would all be very willing to purchase should it arise. But, despite this reality, Rockstar has remained quite silent on the game and a potential sequel, save for a few coded and cryptic statements from their management teams. But, what I can confidently say is that an L.A. Noir sequel makes sense in whatever form it would take. More on that in a minute. But I don't want you to take my word for it, so I'm going to go through the history of this enigmatic sequel that we all seem to want but nobody is willing to deliver. And of course, if anyone over at Rockstar happens to see this video who could have an impact on this maybe sort of happening, maybe you could, you know, be convinced and make the game and fulfill all my hopes and dreams and then take me out to dinner and drive me home and walk me to my door and... <clears throat> and it, um, let's just let's just get into the into the video. Ellie Noir was designed to be the first game that made its animation quality the driving gameplay feature. Using new and, for the time, revolutionary facial capture systems allowed the developers over at Team Bondi to achieve a level of visual fidelity that had never been seen before 2011. You're lying, Miss Coletta. You know what happened and why. You're going to tell me. I'll kill this son of a. <laughs> Bear in mind, this game launched on the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. This was running on fairly antiquated hardware for 2011, which made it all the more impressive when we first saw the trailers. In fact, I even remember my first experience with the game at all. My uncle owned it for the 360, and he had the case sitting on the couch one day when my family went over to visit him. I was struck by the interesting cover art, and so I opened it, and all of a sudden I realized the case had three discs inside. And I remember being so struck by the thought of how vast the game must be to require three discs to run. And so I asked to borrow it, and before I knew it, I was home solving my first few murder cases. It's hard to describe, but the feeling that this game gives the player, the quality of the world building, and the life with which the game world is painted all serves to create an experience unlike anything else. I had never encountered anything like this, and little 14-year-old Luke was stunned at how engrossing every twist and turn was. The game really does make full use of its three-disc length campaign. It puts you in the shoes of an up-and-coming homicide detective in the LAPD in late 1940s Los Angeles. Everything from the cars to the music, the acting, dialogue, and even the patterns on the cloth that makes up the lead character's suits proves historically accurate and effective in establishing the world of L.A. Noir as that of post-World War II America. All of this took an immense amount of work. Team Bondi, Bondi, you know what, I'm really not sure how to pronounce that. Is it Bondi, Bondi? I've I have no, you know what, I'll say Team Bondi. There's a bar here where I live called Bondi, so I'll just, I'll call it that. Team Bondi worked for over seven years to create L.A. Noir, and it almost didn't release after a close call in 2009 when they couldn't actually get the demo build working when Rockstar executives showed up to see the game's progress. There were a plethora of technical issues with the game. For one, data streaming was pretty terrible, leading to extreme pop-in when driving throughout the map. Furthermore, load times were very, very long, and the massive video files required for every character's facial animations proved very taxing in terms of storage on the game's discs, hence the three discs on the 360 port. In addition, the facial animations weren't dynamic at all. They were all recorded and projected onto basic meshes. This is something known in the business as sticky mapping, a technique where you basically project a 2D texture, or in this case a video, onto a mesh in 3D space so that it can move freely within 3D space as though it were a 3D texture from the outset. It's a technique that's used in movies and TV, all to allow you to create a 3D scene from something as simple as a single picture. Heck, I even used it in one such clip earlier in this video made by Andrew Price from Blender Guru. It's actually pretty easy. You can even do it for free using free software that you just download off the internet. 
However, that's in 2020. In 2011, this was groundbreaking and it was very hard to get working, especially in a video game setting and considering they were forced to use antiquated hardware and consoles. But despite this, they were able to get all of it working, and they eventually launched the game in 2011 to extraordinarily positive reviews. It sold quite well, and talk of a sequel began almost immediately. However, Team Bondi had screwed up pretty massively while working on the game. The management were accused of pushing their employees into 12-hour workdays and months and months of crunch time. They had extremely high turnover with their employees because of these work conditions, and furthermore, there were even a plethora of accusations against the game's creative director, Brendan McNamara, stating that he was directly responsible for poor management and cultivating a toxic work environment. All of this came out immediately after the release of L.A. Noir, and it resulted in Rockstar Management severing ties with the studio completely. This left Team Bondi on their own, and after searching for a new studio to partner with, they failed to find anyone willing to buy in. And so, Team Bondi was left with upset employees, dysfunctional management, and a brand that was known for making a cool game, sure, but also for mistreating their employees. And so, in August of 2011, they announced that they were looking for a buyer. And after failing to find one, they entered liquidation on October 5th of 2011. Once this process began, everybody realized just how poorly managed the company really was. They actually owed over 1.4 million Australian dollars to various people and groups, with over 75% of that debt being owed directly to their own employees. According to a Kotaku report from the time, 33 staff credited for their work on L.A. Noir were owed a combined 1.074 million Australian dollars in unpaid wages or bonuses. And among those, McNamara, the creative director, claimed to be owed over $102,000 for his work on the game. All of this to say, Team Bondi was a mismanaged mess, and frankly, it's amazing that they got anything released at all. But despite their liquidation, the team splintered off and started work on a new project under the veil of KMM Interactive Entertainment, a studio partially established by Corey Barlog. Yes, God of War Corey Barlog. They started working on a new game that was set to be the spiritual successor to L.A. Noir. It was a game internally known as Whore of the Orient. It was to use similar tech as L.A. Noir, and it was to be set in Shanghai in 1936. They worked on it for a couple of years, and we even got leaked gameplay from it that looks half-decent considering it was something that was very early in production. But in 2016, it was confirmed that they had officially abandoned the project and that what was left of the L.A. Noir team had been disbanded and broken up. So it doesn't look good. Rockstar severed ties and appeared very upset with the team, and the developers disbanded and went defunct. Surely, L.A. Noir has been lost to history and will never be touched again by Rockstar or anyone else in their development umbrella. But wait, what's this? Oh, it's a remaster. It is. And a Switch port. Oh, joy. And a VR expansion. Wonderful. It seemed like overnight in 2017, Rockstar remembered how much people loved L.A. Noir, and they began releasing it with new textures, animations, and different ports. It showed that they still cared for the franchise and that they weren't giving up on it. Furthermore, it proved that they still held legal rights to the game and its IP, something that was seriously in question after Team Bondi's dissolution in 2011. If ever there was a sign that Rockstar could be playing with the idea of a sequel, this would be it. The revitalization of a franchise that seemed lost to history. But to be perfectly honest, this is all still just conjecture. There's not much evidence either way. So allow me to wrap up with some reasons for and against a sequel. You see, for one, the game is still popular, and the remasters sold quite well according to all of the numbers that have been released publicly. Interest is still high, and this style of game does have its fans. In addition, true crime is taking off right now and is more popular than ever. Look at the surge of true crime on YouTube, in podcasts and documentaries. It's huge, and taking advantage of it with a AAA video game just makes sense. Furthermore, the tech has evolved and is only going to help create a more efficient and effective game of this style. However, there are reasons not to do a strict L.A. Noir sequel. 
For one, it's clear that L.A. Noire's story wraps up pretty cleanly. For those of you who haven't played it, I won't spoil the final moment, but let's just say there's little room for a part two to Cole's story. Because of this, another game in the same time and place likely wouldn't work well, unless it were just a straight remake, which could work, but isn't necessarily what's being discussed in this video. Lastly, if they chose to do an L.A. Noir style game in another time and place, such as Shanghai in 1936, it would affect effectively be a spiritual successor, not a direct follow-up, which isn't inherently bad, but it isn't exactly the direct sequel that a lot of people want. But all told, there are reasons for and against creating a sequel to the game. While I understand and am extremely sympathetic to the sequel argument, I think there is something to be said for L.A. Noir being left alone. It was a fantastic game, and one of the most immersive stories and worlds that I've ever explored. And so, leaving it to age like a fine wine, untainted and corrupted, seems like a fair decision to me. But a sequel, spiritual or not, would be fantastic, and I think we all would welcome it with open arms. But what would you like to see? Let me know in the comment section below. Also, please like and subscribe to get more videos like this. But thank you for watching, I love all of you more than you could possibly know, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.